Okay. Three, two, one. And we are officially on. Hello, everyone. This is episode one of the True Leisure Podcast. A huge welcome to everyone who is watching. My name is Navinder. I hope everyone is having a wonderful day so far. We are officially kicking off this first episode of the podcast. <clears throat> we're, are, we're going through a bit of an unprecedented time right now. And it, with the, in the midst, midst of everything going on, uh, my colleagues and I thought that this was a good opportunity to establish some dialogue on various topics like art and science. Uh, I will let everybody else introduce themselves. Okay. Hi, I'm Alex. Um, my name is Gurkirat, but you can call me G. And I'm Ethan. Uh, we are, this first episode of our podcast, we are doing it on space. More specifically, we are talking about uh, technology and industrialization in space in the context of expanding uh, into space. Um, we're going to be ta- talking about various things like the advancement of technology, colonization, privatization, and industrialization in the context of space. Um, We will, we're going to get started now, and I hope everybody enjoys, and if you do, um, please let us know, and uh, we hope you really like this. All right, G, you, you talk, you did research on um, the advancement of technology in the context of space, correct? Yeah. Yes, I did. So what sort of things that what sort of things that did you do research on because I'm assuming that the advancement of technology when we talk about space, most people uh think about, you know, rockets and spaceships and satellites things like that. So can you explain uh, what sort of things that you did research on? Well, before I can answer that question, I would like to go over some of my background with space so personally i'm a huge science fiction fan science fiction fan and i love the idea of space travel and before we go into talking about rockets i wanted to actually bring up alternative ideas that people have theory crafted on ways that we can get humanity into space okay this is my there m- many of these are absurd but this is my top 5 list of alternative methodologies to rockets just a you know nice uh, small casual kickoff so at number 5 there's the space plane it's very simple it's just an airplane but it's able to travel on and low orbit and it can allow for tourism and it can allow for people to travel at a much faster pace than normal commercial airlines because of the reduced uh, drag in the air and friction. And it could be used in space if uh, certain technologies were implemented on the craft. At number four, there is the Star Tram. If you've heard of maglev, which is, uh, if you've heard of the maglev train, it's very similar to that concept, where there is a kind of a uh, cargo, there's cargo on a maglev system, and it's going to push off at a very high velocity, and then it's going to go up onto a ramp, casually at a steeper and steeper angle until it shoots out of orbit and it will the the trajectory will be calculated to hit a target destination at number three there is the orbital ring so the orbital ring is an idea that was crafted basically we have a huge ring if you ever played halo then imagine a huge ring that is rotating around earth at more at a faster speed than which earth rotates okay and then any any spacecraft 
will be rotating along with that orbital ring and then like a sling like how you uh throw a rock with a sling you will essentially be projecting a spacecraft off of the ring as it is traveling at that velocity at number two there is the space elevator which has anyone ever been to an amusement i'm assuming everyone has been here to an amusement park yeah yep Yep. you know the those rides where it takes you to a really great height and then it drops you yeah yeah Uh, the drop tower yeah now imagine that but it goes all the way up into space and the thing that's dropping is a counterweight and it propels us upwards into space Hmm. and uh the space elevator will branch off into a different planet oh my okay so i have a question with that one yeah suppose the if the the counterweight can't be in space right unless there's like a thrust pushing it back down into earth's atmosphere so that gravity affects it right yeah that's exactly it however the main issue with this obvious issue with this is that you would need a as a cable as it's called strong enough to be able to extend all the way up past earth's atmosphere yeah also all right wouldn't you need earth and mars to be like connected the thing is they can't they can't be connected so that's the flaw with the space elevator because if they were connected eventually the cable would hit the sun and it would just melt so it seems only plausible with the moon yeah this it's more plausible with the moon and then it would have to like either fix the moon's rotation or it would have to like go along with the moon yeah that's one flaw all right and then number one my personal favorite i've thought about this when i was a young lad and i looked into it and i was sad that it could not be realized the space gun we put people in sort of a shell casing and fire them from a gun with high enough caliber that they can reach escape velocity like a human torpedo Okay. It's like that scene in Doom Eternal, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like the clown flying out of a cannon, except they're literally going into space. Yeah. The issue with this is that it would require it would be way too expensive to create an explosion or any sort of uh, any sort of pulse that can send a projectile. Um, all the way up into the atmosphere and still maintain escape velocity and if there was then the cargo would be a hundred percent obliterated the the g-force on whatever's in there sounds insane yeah i would not want to accelerate too like yeah now uh now that i've gone over this let's get back to the topic of rockets So, continuing on with my interest in space travel, uh, in my first year of university, I actually took a course in astronomy. It was going to cover the space age, which is pretty much the history of astronomy in the recent uh, century. So, for the first half of the entire class, we learned about, well, rocket history, the development of rockets both scientifically and historically and even a little bit of uh, politics as well so it all started around uh like the 1910s where people started theory crafting ways that we could branch out into space how we could escape earth and uh scientists in uh russia in the u.s and germany around the same time they never even associated with each other they all just came up with the theory that we could use rockets to escape uh earth's gravity because of its uh shape and because of its ability to hold liquid fuel the idea was taken from fireworks now um the u.s was actually the first 
to implement a prototype, uh, Robert Goddard, who's well known in uh, in astronomy, was the first one to create that rocket, and he would soon go on to develop multiple more prototypes, and those prototypes would continue to reach higher and higher, and hobby groups started to form where people literally just got together to make rockets out of scrap and these interest societies started appearing all over the u.s all over germany and all over what was now the ussr or what was then the ussr and once the government managed once the government saw that this was actually like an industry that was skyrocketing pun not intended they sought the opportunity to incorporate those interest groups into their military the ussr and the u.s both took advantage of rocket science to further develop the, the technology for missiles uh, in World War II, Germany was the most ahead in rocket development. However, when they lost the World War, uh, the U.S. and the Soviets split the scientists, the German scientists, amongst themselves and the parts amongst themselves so that they could continue their own research. And that's kind of how the space race started. The U.S. and the Soviets were both working off of Germany's... Uh, intellect and um just trying to see who could outdo the other and eventually it got to the point where the rockets could actually escape the atmosphere now many of us know that in 1969 neil armstrong was the first man to walk on the moon but what a lot of people don't know is that Yuri Gagarin was the first man to do the spacewalk, which is when you leave your vessel and you walk in zero orbit. In fact, the Soviets are well known for a lot of things that they did. It's just that the U.S. has been kind of highlighting the oh we landed on the moon first but the soviets literally did everything else first now uh i think it was 1959 or 1958 uh it was considered the geophysical year yeah 1958 the geophysical year was when like the peak of rocket as rocket development was because this is when people in both nations started creating more official uh projects and the countries were a lot more intense in their competition and this is when they started developing uh things known as intercontinental ballistic missiles and uh tr wait yeah just inter intercontinental and there was another one but it's not intercontinental it's interrange or something like that anyways um from there the class stopped talking about rockets and they started talking about the moon and mars and just whatever we did with the rocket technology that we developed. But what I want to talk about for this podcast is how the rocket development has continued. How in the modern day, we have <coughs> developed our, our rockets to reach new heights. Any questions so far before I continue? I think we're good. Okay. So, many of you guys know NASA. 
NASA were the people that were responsible for launching the rocket to the moon. But their their fame, their place in the astronomical industry world is not solidified there. See, NASA continued to innovate and they eventually came out with landing the Mars rover on Mars and discovering water. They they partnered with a bunch of other nations to establish the International Space Station. They led the project to land on asteroids in the asteroid belt. And in 2014, they even landed a comet, or landed a satellite on a comet, on the nebula. So, NASA has done a lot of projects, a lot of, they've reached a lot of achievements that they aren't recognized for by, some, by a lot of people. So that's what I wanted to capitalize on today, that the technology is still developing and people have been expanding what we thought was physically possible. Now, today NASA is working with SpaceX. Now, if you know SpaceX, they are probably the biggest private company in space tech. And they have been uh, embark embarking on a lot of projects in the past many years. Their most recent one, where they sent, they funded a rocket that could take men to the, to the ISS, was considered a huge breakthrough in not just what was government funded, but what could also be privately funded. And we'll get back to that later. But what, I've, what I'm saying is that SpaceX is definitely working with NASA. They're definitely a leader in space technology. And they have been working to innovate and modify even some of the things, some of the shortcomings of the past century. For example, the rocket that took the astronauts to the moon was it utilized a command service module system and the, uh, this system basically consisted of a command module where they you know s looked over everything and then the service module where they had all of the gear and this was a very effective system. I mean, it landed them on the moon. But the issue was with it is that it was only geared towards re-entry for one time only. And so what SpaceX has been working for is creating reusability in rockets, making sure that they can launch multiple times, and possibly even commercial flights with, uh, commercial flights with shuttles. So that's what I have to say for now for the modern escapades of rocket science. Okay. I'm going to finish up my section with the future escapades. So NASA's journey doesn't end with Apollo. They have actually started a program called the Artemis program, the sequel to Apollo. And their goal is to <clears throat> land on the moon in 2024 and stay there and of course they've been doing other things like improving maintenance systems fortifying interplanetary communication channels and space tourism could be a real thing where we would have the space planes uh, the shuttles that would orbit the ionosphere and in my honest opinion and my optimistic I'm pretty optimistic about space and where humanity will be in the next few years I feel like in 2030 we'll have a space station on the moon a fully functioning space base and by 2040 we will have 
a suburban neighborhood on Mars. But that is yet to be determined, and we will see what time has in store for us. Right, and um, well, thank you for your uh, your insights and your research. And uh, one of the things that you mentioned right there at the end is um, uh, a suburban neighborhood. And you also mentioned earlier that about SpaceX and their collaboration with NASA in most recent times. And I think something that's very interesting and something that that has to that's worth talking about is um, because we all know that Elon Musk is um, he has he has this idea this vision of colonization in space especially colonization on Mars and Ethan um uh, you uh, you have some insights about colonization in space right yeah I do yeah I do uh, but before going there um, I want to ask your curate a few things or would you like to be called G for the podcast uh, G for the podcast is fine. All right, sounds good. Well, I was really interested by like the suburban neighborhood idea. You want to like go into detail on what you envision personally? Well, there's not much on colonization on Mars as of yet. As of right now, we only have the rover on Mars. They are NASA is planning on sending out another mission to Mars to confirm life and just ensure that the conditions of uh, the conditions on Mars could sustain life potentially, and so that's why I project that we could possibly have a, a colony on Mars, and it's really it's represented in uh, a lot of science fiction as well. And so I just thought it was plausible in the next 20 years. Yeah, it's surprising how far science fiction has gone from being just fiction to nearly a reality. There was, like, another thing, I believe, where NASA lost a lot of funding from the government. Do you guys have any um, info on that specifically? I think over the last few presidencies, they switched focus <clears throat> from Mars and the moon. I'm not super sure on, like, specifics. Uh, I just remember that the, after landing on the moon and getting a rover on Mars, it seemed like they they didn't completely defund, but they removed, like, a majority of the funding for NASA, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Do you guys think that's, like, an oversight? for the future and what's projecting about what we're doing right now? It, it, it kind of depends what they use the money for. Instead of using it for NASA's development of like deep space exploration and technology advancement. If it's for, if they defunded it in favor of like okay, we're gonna build some more ballistic missiles or something, or hmm, something like or they like start bringing back the Cold War or something like it's definitely not worth it. Yeah, or doing it, I remember doing it as like a publicity stunt for some campaign then then I would say that it wasn't worth taking the funding away but if it was for something that was really useful like developing healthcare or something like that yeah no uh, I definitely see that because a lot of people tend to view space as not only like what the extent of our modern technology is but it's also what our future is at the same time, right? So there, there are priorities that we do have to take into account. But right, but at, at the same time, I feel like in recent years, the government's taken more of a stance on um, militarization, like uh, after the Cold War, especially. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Anyway, 
Have you guys heard of Mars One? Sorry? Mars One? Mars, Mars One. I've heard Mars. it brief, briefly. I'm well, not, not sure what it exactly is. Okay, perfect. Cause that's exactly what I looked up into. Um, Mars One is the alternative to SpaceX almost. They're almost like competing brands. Where SpaceX is more developing the rockets themselves and doing everything independently with the help of NASA, like G said. Mars One is more focused on getting to Mars and establishing themselves. Uh, I looked into SpaceX. Let me check my notes. SpaceX was more focused on telling everybody how they were planning on getting there. So, one second. They gave info on their site of very basic things. They didn't give away too much. Okay, okay. and you said that they're, they're competitors? Not necessarily competitors, but they like target the same market. I think it's just... I don't know. If you could explain more about why you think they're competitors, I think that'd be good. I'm not really sure. Oh, uh, maybe competitors is the wrong word. But they're they, in the same market. They have the same goals. Right, but I almost. think like in terms of like um, this field of privatization and business, there's ten does tend to be a lot of competition with people um, that are in the same industry. Yeah. The. Right. Okay. Yeah. The the main thing here is that. Uh, Mars One specifically uses more public funding and donations. Okay. And the issue with that is that if more people are going to donate to SpaceX, they get less just naturally. Yeah. So if they're not direct competitors, they're naturally getting less money for what they're trying to do. Okay. Is So Mars One is privately owned? It's not under NASA or something? It is privately owned, but they do sell public stock. So okay. I believe it would be considered publicly owned now. As of 2011, I believe. Basically, their entire mission uh, can be summed up into one set. Since, so, on their site, they refer to how they're going to bring a group of 24 people <coughs> on, and they're going to establish a settlement with trees and get everything started, basically, so that we can start colonizing it properly. And they say... As more astronauts arrive, the creativity applied to settlement expansion will certainly give ways to ideas and innovation that cannot be conceived now. But it can be expected that the human spirit will continue to preserve and even thrive in this challenging environment. Their entire idea, basically, is they want to get a head start and they kind of want to see how it, the people who are living there themselves can develop naturally. Of course, they're going to resupply it. And they're going to do so every 26 months and bring extra people so they can expand the colony. But as of now, they're relying more on their applicants. It's pretty interesting as their application process would have allowed everybody who wanted to to come in. It's actually four steps. The first step was anybody who wanted to apply needed to give a motivational letter and a reason they want to be on Mars in the first place almost to establish what kind of person they are and if they really have like the guts to get through, right? Mm -hmm. The second step was they needed a medical report and a quick interview. The medical rec report is obvious. You need people who are healthy enough to sustain life on somewhere completely new. But the interview was more tailored to weed out very specific individuals. If you didn't answer the questions correctly, you were basically going to be left out of the next group. Almost like uh, how Cicada 3301 did it, if you guys remember. It was an internet group where they would put out an interview to anyone who can solve their puzzle. And if you didn't align with their ideals, you wouldn't get invited into the group. Same concept. Okay. Uh, the third step. 
there would only be a hundred people left by this point after weeding through the others and they would be split into a final four of six uh six groups of four sorry they would have to do individual challenges almost like maybe a scouting group or like a field day sort of idea just to test their creativity and their physical strengths and then at the very end they would resort to an isolation challenge where they would have to spend a lot of time alone of course because you're only going to have a group of six people in your area you're going to have to learn to live with them and without them every now and then it's a difficult process of course and then one last interview would weed out the last 30 people into 24 and from there it would just be four people every 26 months like i said before so if people wanted to apply it's not too late necessarily however they wouldn't be able to get into the first batch they've actually been weeding it out for i believe seven years now ever since the first group of applicants it's incredibly thorough but you need to be for something of this caliber spacex doesn't necessarily tell us who they're hiring as astronauts they probably have a more professional approach less tailored to like the general population and more to people who might have been working to be astronauts scientists and the such but um question yes. about spacex astronauts yes so they've only they sent one manned mission this year, I think, in May. Oh, really? Shoot. I did not that see was, that. Um, it was for refueling the ISS. Yeah, it was, the, it was the one that I referred to earlier. It was uh, SpaceX. They sent two people, or they sent a, yeah, they sent a group of people to the International Space Station on their privately funded rockets. Yeah. Yeah. What about it? I think... I don't think that SpaceX actually hires astronauts because in that mission they used two NASA astronauts. They just provided the shuttle, like they used the Falcon Nine rocket. That yeah. would make sense. That was yeah. in twenty four, uh, twenty seventeen, I believe. No, that was this year. This uh, year, a month ago. It was actually three weeks ago. Oh. Really? There was also Falcon 9 uh, used by SpaceX in 2016. Right. Yeah, SpaceX doesn't have a lot of direct information regarding life on Mars themselves. They just seem to be, like, the leader in this field for the most part. Just because they have all the funding necessary. The, the problem with Mars 1 is that they only have a million USD to work with currently just from sales and from stocks and all that but SpaceX obviously has a lot more money backed up because of Elon Musk yeah although Great. SpaceX seems like they know what they're doing a lot more on their site they specifically give reasons as to why it's possible to inhabit Mars whereas Mars 1 just has the process which is more, their, their planning is definitely dedicated, but they lack the insight scientifically, it seems, at least on the surface. Maybe they just don't release it. Yeah, it, it seems like they're more tailored towards the everyday person, which makes sense you, for their, their model. Do you think that it could be possible that they could merge because as you were referring to right the mars one was the process and spacex has the money mm -hmm. so when it comes time perhaps they could merge and mars one would give their group of selected people to spacex i i think it's possible but probably not likely the thing about SpaceX is that they're basically a fully American company, right? And Mars One is more worldwide. They were actually fun 
They were actually founded in the Netherlands. And I don't believe hearing anything about each other from from anything they were releasing. They probably know each other exists, but they don't have any plans of working together. At least on the surface. Is Mars One still a thing? Uh, didn't they dissolve? Did they dissolve? Their site's still up. I don't think they dissolved. Hold on one second. They're, they're on the early stages of planning is what I saw recently. Yeah, they're okay. they're defunct. Really? Yeah, they dissolved uh, January 15, 20, 20, 2019. Mm -hmm. Apparently, they uh, basically received money from investors by like saying what you said. Uh, they they would use it to land the first humans on Mars and leave them there to establish a permanent colony. But apparently, the didn't quite pan out. Yeah. I mean, they did not get a lot of funding for yeah. what they were planning on doing. Yeah, because, I mean, it would uh, to introduce something like that back in 2011, it was a huge risk because the technology wasn't there and the foresight wasn't there to actually accomplish what they wanted to. So it was yeah, basically... definitely. SpaceX is definitely way more equipped. Like, even if they were still around, I don't think Mars 1 would have had the same chance of successfully doing it just because SpaceX has a lot more of the science backed into it. Yeah. I just feel like it's the way of human history that even though Mars One, their program didn't work out, they dissolved, they still set a precedent. Yeah, and I think it was important that they definitely at least set it up. Yeah, as there will be innovators in the future who will want to pursue the same endeavor right it sort of kicked off that idea that uh an industry or a private business or a corporation um, doing business in space yeah it's kind of interesting because it seems like there's like a pattern of where what the person who initially starts something never fully realizes it but the people who innovate on that usually make it a reality yeah so it may it makes the idea of a suburban neighborhood on Mars by 2040 feasible. Yeah. Right, and because and especially in the context of space technologies advancing, we've sort of seen like pretty rapid growth happen. You know, we yeah. went we went um, all the way from uh, sending people up to the moon to you know sending satellites all the way to Saturn. Yeah, it's pretty good. To, you know, recently capturing a picture of the very first black hole. Oh, really? Do you know where the black oh, hole is? I remember that. Yeah, it was like something like 65 million light years away. Dear God. That's impressive. It looked, it looked like a donut. I mean, you couldn't see it because a lot of the light was sucked out. So. I mean, the, you the could see the it looked like a donut because of the event horizon. Right. I mean, the picture yeah. itself was was really blurry, but I mean, to just capture something that we knew existed uh, mathematically, but we didn't have actual evidence of it, like photo evidence, is it's, it's a pretty phenomenal thing. Yeah, no, that's yeah, the power of math. So, okay. yeah, Alex, I believe you had to talk about, or no, Akash. Yeah. You want to talk about the industrial age right. after so, the colonization? Right. So, I mean, we, we, we mentioned SpaceX, right? And SpaceX is coming a lot into this conversation, as I thought it would, because whenever we talk about something like space and technology, SpaceX or NASA is like the two giants within that. But um, I wanted to talk about something, uh, another thing that um, was developed by this company called Tethers Unlimited. Uh, this was back in 2014 March. Basically, NASA, they awarded a $750,000 contract to this company called Tethers Unlimited because they had this uh, technology called SpiderFab, which is basically just like a spider 
a robot spider with arms and it used one of their devices called the Trusslator to create trusses and if anybody doesn't know what a truss is if you've ever gone to uh like a bridge and it, you see the beams on the side they have like those crisscross smaller beams connecting each other that's that's basically what a truss is and basically their trussulator was a device that weaved trusses from lightweight trusses which is the important part from carbon fiber uh i think i think it's carbon fiber i'm pretty sure I can't imagine it being anything else, but that that was a pretty uh, that was a pretty innovative thing, and it was a breakthrough too. Because if you can use a device like this to create trusses um, to combine components of various things like antennas or satellites, that reduces the amount of payload that you have to send up to space physically with a rocket. Because if you can just develop it in space, then you don't have to develop it on Earth and then send it up into space. And that's some, that's like a, um, a theme or a concept that I've seen reoccurring because whenever we talk about in industrialization, even, even in uh, the industrial revolution that happened in the past, the whole idea behind it was to make things more efficient. And that's efficiency is sort of like the combining fact, the common factor between any sort of industrialization that we see. And it's the same thing for space industrialization. You know, the whole uh, idea behind it is to make things more efficient. And the spider fab and the trust technology is something that it was developed to make things more efficient. And another thing along those lines is um, something that uh, something that's uh, becoming more and more prominent in space industrialization is to uh, manuf that to manufacture things that you would uh, do on, that you would manufacture on earth on in orbit or in space so traditional earth based manufacturing should be done in space that's uh, something that i've seen and something that if i can if i can add to that yeah uh, I did read while I was doing research on the, fu the future things that NASA was planning on implementing. Mm -hmm. uh, I mentioned improved maintenance systems. Right. What that I didn't get to expand on it, mm -hmm. but basically what that means is they're utilizing 3D printing technology yeah. to essentially create these. They could 3D print uh, parts for their spaceships. Right. And kind of repair on the go. Right. And they're looking to perhaps use various minerals uh, and metals that they harvest from other places off off Earth to 3D print. Like, do you guys know what regolith is? I do not. It's the it's the layer on the moon. It's the layer of rocks of finely ground rocks, and it. Is cons it is one of the, like the main things that astronauts took samples from uh, when they were on the moon, and so yeah. To add to your point, three D printing in um, space is definitely an endeavor that is being looked into. Right, and um, another. I'm glad you mentioned the using minerals and metals because that's that was actually my next point. Because something that we've seen come into play is asteroid mining, and the whole idea behind asteroid mining is we can use we can use that to mine metals like platinum so that we don't have to do that on earth and what that would in turn do is reduce the fuel requirement of sending rockets to geostationary orbit and that that basically all plays into the idea of efficiency and expanding the horizons of what industrialization means so uh, efficiency with like we saw the spider fab technology and creating components in space so that we don't have to send them up to space after developing them on earth and uh, actually mining resources for that so that we can uh, better utilize the technologies that we develop on earth to send up to space and but you know with everything that we see things like sending things up to space i feel like there is definitely a risk because after uh after the whole after the cold war and this idea of trying to get into space and you know the the next frontier the new frontier um, 
more and more companies, more and more private companies, and uh, more and more countries are trying to move into space, and that that itself is a risk because. Have any of you guys heard of the Kessler effect? No. Okay. Sounds familiar. Okay, so basically there was a, a, a NASA scientist, Donald J. Kessler, who uh, proposed this scenario of the Kessler effect, basically that where there's so many objects in orbit that you know one object crashes into another which creates debris and they go and crash into other objects which creates more degree and it's basically a domino effect like say just for example one collision causes 10 pieces right and those 10 pieces go out and create more 10 pieces each for each and it just sort of exponentially grows until we have this the entire atmosphere of the earth is just you know polluted with these this debris and trash and I think that is something that also should be taken into consideration because with everything that we see industrialization and uh, when commercial players come into something like this is that profit seems to be the number one motive but I feel like when we're trying when we're talking about the new frontier and trying to expand into space that we need to make sure to tread carefully and because it you know we, it's not it's not a environment that we're familiar that we're familiar with like we are on earth right because there's there's no gravity there's no friction there's no basically nothing in space but um yeah i think uh, we'll see what happens because it's still it's still quite early to tell because budgets for science and space exploration they're uh, it's sort of on edge right now but i feel like once the entire idea of space exploration becomes more widespread and people start realizing that this is like a, this is an industry that people can use and profit and it's a it's a good industry i feel like uh, geopolitical interest is going to get renewed and that would in turn create better uh, opportunities for budgeting and spending but, and, you know, we can't talk about industrialization without privatization. And I feel like, Alex, you, you that's where you come in. You yep. researched um, privatization, right? Yep. Take it, right. take it away. So, just start off with a quick definition. Privatization is, it has a few things, but it's related to moving things from public domain to private domain, right? Right. So, the question is, should we concede decisions that involve space to private companies, or should they be funded and, like, collectively chosen? Mm -hmm. So, some things that we've gotten from privatization so far are things like the... Uh, SpaceX launched three weeks ago with the ISS. Mm -hmm. There's also the... Um, it's kind of like the shuttle idea that G mentioned at the beginning, but it's Virgin Galactic. They're making this spaceship called Spaceship Two, mm -hmm. and the goal with it is to start... It's to be like a commercial space flight shuttle, basically, in low Earth orbit. Okay. And there's another thing with Sierra Nevada, which is the Dream Chaser, mm -hmm. which is set to launch next year, and it's going to have a bunch of cargo space. It's going to hook up with the ISS, and then it's going to be able to come back down with maybe experiment data or things like that. Okay. It's going to be able to hold people, and it's going to land. It's... Basically, it's more of the shuttle idea that she had before, mm -hmm. where it lands on a runway because it looks like a plane. So it's that renewability thing. Okay. Yeah. So the argument against privatization is there's a few ideas. There's things like monopoly over resources. So say something 
is only found on an asteroid, mm -hmm. it, like we run out of helium or something, mm -hmm. then they could just choose not to give it to humanity. Right. Because of the right. profit. <clears throat> Um, another thing is you won't get or it's unlikely to get things like the Hubble Space Telescope mm -hmm. or the moon landing yeah. or Voyager mm -hmm. with the golden record yeah. with privatized things because of due, due to the the profit incentive there isn't really a profit with sending people to the moon right. as of right now right but then, on the other hand, some of the pros are government-funded agencies are pretty slow. You have to peel back the like the bureaucracy, mm -hmm. so you get a much better innovation. So things like satellite launching that have a that are where the money is right now, mm -hmm. you'll get a lot of competition for that. So think companies like SpaceX. They supplied the shuttle for refu like restocking the ISS. Mm -hmm. They didn't have the astronauts, or, and they didn't send manned spaceships to another planet. Mm -hmm. It's more of the, I guess, I don't know if logistics is the right word, but it's more of like the supplementary stuff, whereas NASA is focusing a lot on interplanetary ventures and technology development for learning more about the galaxy and the universe. There's also the problem with government, which was the after Challenger, when it blew up, mm -hmm. it basically shut down the program for developing the spaceships. I'm not exactly sure what the name is, but it was stopped for a few years, whereas you know, SpaceX released a video called, titled um, How Not to Land a Booster, and it's just the montage of it like crashing into the ground. <laughs> so they, they don't have to worry about their public image or something like with Virgin Galactic, they had a few casualties. They don't have to stop because of public opinion that gets rid of all their funding mm -hmm. that's something to think about like ethics and whatnot right in space like of course going into space is dangerous it's literally a vacuum humans cannot they cannot exist in that vacuum for more than a few minutes so it is something to consider that if we are going into space that there will be casualties there will be people that will unfortunately have to sacrifice for humanity at least that's the way i see it mm -hmm. right it's an unseen we can't foresee all of the different problems we're gonna run into yeah yeah so furthermore on privatization there's been a few notable legislation, or there's been a few bills that have been passed, like the Commercial Launch Act in 1984 with Reagan, that basically legalized spaceflight, like commercial spaceflight. Mm -hmm. And also, in 2015, there was the U.S. Commercial Space Launch Competitiveness Act, which let U.S. companies own resources acquired from space. Yeah. So this privatization letting private companies do their have their way with certain things in space is definitely inevitable now it's just how do we make sure that's the best thing that we can do mm -hmm. one thing to mention is um there's this trend with idealistic billionaires right yeah it's elon musk Jeff Bezos mm -hmm. and they do these they're similar to NASA where they do these low profit ventures just because they want to see it 
happen before they're dead. Mm-hmm. So example with that, with that would be the Shepard rocket that Jeff Bezos had in 2015, where that was the first vertical touchdown. Like they, they relanded it vertically. Mm-hmm. And there's also the Spaceship Two that I mentioned earlier. It's owned by a billionaire, Richard Branson. So even though commercial space flight's not super profitable right now, he's still pushing for it. And there's the Yuri Milner Starshot program, which is, he's a Russian billionaire and he's trying to get a space probe into another star system. So the problem with that is they're not going to last forever, but they kind of do the job of NASA better with their low profit ventures. So as long as they're here, it's okay. But once they're passed and the board of the company takes over, they're probably not going to be as idealistic anymore. Mm Mm-hmm. So, in my opinion, the best thing that we can do is keep private enterprise, because it's inevitable, but we need this sort of symbiotic relationship with government-funded agencies like NASA, so that there isn't monopoly over something, or things like that. Right. I definitely agree with you there. It's just like a safety net, right? Safety net as in we want the government agencies to kind of keep their keep an eye on them. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Checks and balances, right? Uh, okay. I think we're at a good spot. How do you guys feel? Is there anything you guys want to bring up? Anything's I left have a question unsaid? before. Sorry. Anything's left unsaid? Um, I had a question bef- before about the, the spider robot that you're mentioning. Go for it. Spider, f- what is it? Spider fab? Yeah. Okay. So, is the spider fab going to get material from the planet that it lands on if it's used? No, I, or is it I, I, think, it, it? I think it brings material with it, so... Uh, like I said, I'm pretty sure. Uh, so basically, what it spider fab the idea behind it is to decrease cost and increase efficiency. So, right, launching truss structures into orbit is less efficient than just launching raw materials like carbon fiber. So, oh, yeah. so what the idea behind it is that you send raw materials like carbon fiber uh, with rockets up up to space as payloads and then there the ro- the robots use these materials to create trust st- structures so the trussellator uses the material to create trusses and i believe spider fab is what uses the trusses to assemble the pieces into a larger structure at least that's how i understood it okay so it's a it's not a weight thing it's more of like a volume thing I, i'm pretty sure if they're okay that makes sense. I don't know. How do you guys feel about idealistic billionaires as opposed to a fully government run? Like, if we only had NASA. Okay, I feel like I feel like they both have their drawbacks, but ideally, they both have the same goal in mind. Right. Right, like, yeah, some private will be fueled by capitalism, and government will be under the watchful eye of public opinion. But either way, they're both trying to make a difference in propelling humanity forward. And whatever limitation there is on that, well, that's just what it is. Right, I think, but at the same time, I feel like a lot of billionaires, especially idealistic billionaires, they sort of, like Jeff Bezos, they 
they have this idea of trying to propel humanity forward, but instead they sort of just do it to line their own pockets, which I feel like I feel like okay, profit is like yeah, it's it's a it's a good motivator, and profit should be a factor in when you're trying to do something. You know, everybody wants to make money, but I feel like there also has to be that aspect of you know philanthropism or altruism if you want to mm-hmm. if you really want to you know change public opinion and change the way the world works because nobody can do that better than people who have capital to spend right you know uh, right somebody who somebody i think the person who really makes a difference in the world is not the person is not the person who has the right ideals but the person who knows how to implement those ideals right and people with capital are better suited to implement their ideals to change the world and i th- i think there's definitely a conversation to be had about something like space exploration because it's a field that at sub- that's at the peak of human innovation and to be a pioneer within that i think is a pretty phenomenal thing yeah i'm definitely with you there i, I do like the idea of these billionaires being able to just give what they have because on one end what are you, what else are you going to spend that money on right like right. if you want to see something that no one else can see then you're going to have to be the one to do it right and in that sense they're also giving back yeah like that's why you also see them donating millions to tons of different charities and such because it's just better for everybody and it doesn't harm them enough to make it. How much does Jeff Bezos donate to charity? I don't imagine it's a lot, though. I could, I could be wrong, because I heard he pays like a zero in taxes. Or at least very little in taxes. <laughs> hmm. Of course. Yeah. Um, now, there was one that. small thing I wanted to bring up. You know how the Industrial Revolution of the 1800s, right? Brought about... the environmental crisis that we are still suffering from today mm-hmm. with air pollution yeah and uh, mm-hmm. climate science whatever it's called no it was global warming when i was growing up anyways space industrialization and space pollution i think are gonna go in hand in hand um <coughs> it's not profitable to clean up all of the space junk but it is important to do so because mm-hmm. unlike air pollution here the space pollution the space junk will actively interfere with a lot of space missions right um a lot of maintenance is to be done just because of space junk just ramming into various uh, space stations and mm-hmm. puncturing the walls Right, like I said, the Kessler effect, you know, you don't want exponential growth of pollution. Exactly. Especially at, like, physical material pollution, like, metal. Yeah. Uh, I did some research. But, some quick like, like you know, even, even with pollution, you know, on Earth and pollution in space, I think, like I said before, when you combine the people who truly change the world are the people that combine you know their their idea of profit with their idea of altruism and this the they they want to they use the capital to help the world Uh, i did some research into jeff bezos Mm -hmm. it looks like in 2018 he donated about 107 million 2019 uh, just under a hundred million, and this year February he donated ten billion for climate change. Hmm. Wow. Okay. Yeah, a little more than I expected. Did he? A- did he? Did he actually like give it? Because I heard he just like committed it. Uh, uh, but it, has he, he actually it like given? It's called the Bezos Earth Fund. Basically, any nonprofit that has a chance of affecting the world can. Or in terms of climate change, can ask to take from it. it is what it looks like. Okay, but I feel like if we're gonna compare, then Warren Buffett also gave like forty-four billion. Yeah, Warren Buffett gives a lot. Yeah, too. Warren Buffett is like up there in terms of philanthropy. Mm-hmm. 
Okay. All right. Do you guys have anything else? I think we're good. I'm. I have nothing more to say. I've said every, everything I wanted to. All right. Well, that that's a wrap. That is it for our first episode. Thank you, everyone, for listening in. Please follow us on Instagram at True Leisure Podcast. We will be posting updates about future episodes and topics that we will be covering in the future. And we hope you have a wonderful day. And please stay tuned for the next episode. We will be back with more exciting topics. Thank you.